Hello, today we'll be talking about uh, Battle Lore 2nd Edition. I got this game uh, several years ago. Uh, I think I played it twice two years ago. Um, played that solo um, just as, you know, both players. Um, I went ahead and played it again this week. Um, and I thought I'd go ahead and do a how to play on this. So let's get started with setup. All right, first thing you'll do is place the game board in the center of the table. Uh, normally one player would be sitting on that side of the table. One player would be sitting on this side. Again, since I'm playing uh, solo on this table, I'll have one player sitting here and one player sitting here. But they'll be playing, their figures will be set up on opposite sides of the board like they would be if you had uh, one player sitting on the opposite side of the table. Alright, next each player will choose a side, the Dekan, Dekan or the Uthuk, or blue Dekan and uh, Uthuk red. Each player will take the plastic figures, the unit reference cards, and the deployment cards that go with uh, their faction. Now the game does not come with some partially painted figures and some not painted figures. I just at some point had started to uh, paint this game and never finish. So some of my figures are painted and some are not. I think because my paint job was not coming out good, I, I quit painting it. But uh, I don't know. One of these days I'll get back. Next you'll separate the tokens however you want and create a supply somewhere near the board of... The tokens, like your victory point tokens, lore tokens, damage token, poison tokens, other tokens. So just create a supply of your tokens however you wish and put them somewhere near the board. Next you'll take your command cards which have this back, shuffle them up and place them uh, somewhere near the board where both players can easily reach. Each player will take their scenario uh, cards. Um, this is the Dekan player scenario cards and this is the Uthu players scenario cards. You'll shuffle those and put them in a deck in your play area and each player will also take their lore deck. Um, you can tell which one belongs to which. Uh, the cards with this shield belong to the Dekar, Dekan player. The lore, lore cards with this symbol uh, belong to the Uthu player. They both have the same back, so that's the only way you can tell. Anyway, each side will take their appropriate deck of lore cards, shuffle them up, and put them in their play area. Each player will draw three cards from the top of their scenario deck. They'll look at them and choose one uh, that they want to use for this game. Uh, they'll give you um, how your side will set up um, for this particular game and special rules that pertain to your um, to how your units um, and how they may gain some extra victory points during this uh, particular game. So uh, you pick one, I'll just randomly pick one uh, right now, I'll pick uh, this one. So uh, choose that, you keep it face down, uh, not shown to the opponent. All the other scenario cards um, go back in the box. And of course the Uthu player would do the same thing. Draw the top three, pick one. Uh, I'll just pick one randomly. Again, you, you wouldn't just randomly pick one. You would look at them and pick one that you think uh, you want to play for that particular scenario. Uh, you keep it face down. So once both players have chosen their scenario card, they reveal them and they resolve them and you resolve them first by reading the text um, of your card to each player so they'll know um, what special rules will be in place for your side. So after both sides have read their text aloud, um, then you determine first player. That's done by looking here. Um, whoever has the lowest letter would be the first player if they're both the same letter like in this case they're both a D 
then you go by which player has the lowest number. So since uh, he has D1 and he has D2, the Dekan player will be the first player. And so he will take the first player marker and just put that in his play area. First player does not change throughout the game. Then each player will look at the terrain tiles listed on their scenario card and set them up uh, on their side of the board. So uh, for the way I'm going to be playing uh, right now, we'll say the Decon player is saying, playing on this side of the board. So he'll set up the terrain tiles here on the board uh, to match this picture. And the Uthuk player will be playing on that side of the board. So he will find the appropriate terrain tiles and set them up on that side. So let me go ahead and get that done and I'll come back. All right, so I've got the terrain tiles set up. Uh, as you can see um, how they are on both scenario cards. So. The Uthuk player would have set up his side of the board uh, with the scenario tiles shown on his. Uh, now, actually, I do need to put one uh, banner, which I didn't put, that goes on that hill. So that's that one right there. So I had missed that. But uh, otherwise, it should be set up. Now, you'll see here uh, the Dakon player has a river that should that is going there if the Uthuk player had played a scenario card that had water um, that would run adjacent to this tile you would connect it and make the river connect um, but in this case since we didn't and we just kind of have a river got going off into nowhere just to make that look better you can uh, replace that with another lake tile and just kind of make it look like it's a big lake But anyway, that's how you set up the terrain. Then, uh, once the terrain is set out, each player, starting with the first player, can place a Ford token on uh, one water tile that um, is on his shown on his scenario card. Now, the Uthux player doesn't have a water tile shown on his scenario card, so he doesn't get to place a Ford tile. But because the... Uh, um, the con player does have water he can place a Ford tile so he can place it on any one water tile that's on uh, his scenario card so um, we'll just put this one here that uh, wherever there's a Ford tile uh, it will let you cross the river there now um, for this normally water's impassable but for the Decon player, uh, this time it's really not going to matter too much because he has this special power for this scenario where friendly units may move into and occupy water hexes. When a friendly unit moves into a water hex that does not contain a bridge token, you must spend one lore or end its movement. So uh, normally you can't um, move into a water hex. You can move into a Ford hex, but you have to stop when you enter that. Um, and if there's a bridge, you can cross over that. Now, this scenario doesn't have any bridges. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so each side could place a Ford token if their scenario card showed water, which in this case only the Decon player does. So he places a Ford token. That's where he chooses to place it. All right, next, each player will play th take their deck of deployment cards and muster their army. Now, you'll see uh, each unit has a cost, like uh, a unit of yeoman archers will cost four points. Whereas, let's look at another one, uh, a unit of river, river watch riders will cost six points. So, you can build an army up to 50 points. And you have to use a deployment card, you have to use exactly 18 deployment cards. Now, some of them can be these decoys up to 11 of them can be these decoys that don't cost any uh, points but you'll look through your deployment cards and build an army um, that's worth up to 50 points you can spend less than 50 points and for each point you don't spend um, 
you can get get a lore token which we'll talk about those are but only up to five of those and so you do you have your units you do have a command tent that you can choose which actually gives you a negative five um, so that allows you to actually build an army worth 55 points but the command tent does come with uh, you know a liability where if an enemy unit uh, occupies the space where your command tent is um, at the start of their turn in fact it says it here occupies at the start of their turn he removes the command tent and gains two victory points so um, you know again it gives you an extra five points you can spend but it's also a way the enemy can get uh, two victory points so you can go through and individually pick out how you want to muster your army or each side has three predefined army cards that you can um, choose one and it's already uh, built and you so you can choose that and and get the deployment cards for that particular army so just for simplicity's sake i think that's what we're going to do uh, here so we'll do uh, we'll take this guardians of lore army and uh, we'll get the deployment cards and build that and for the uh, uthuk side We'll say he's going to build this uh, brutal assault army and uh, get these units. Now again, you're, the army you are uh, mustering, you kind of do that in secret. Uh, your opponent doesn't know which one uh, you're going to use. So after you've uh, gotten all your um, deployment cards, so you've mustered your army, then you have to place them on the board in the highlighted locations. Um, so for the Dakon army, he has to place his deployment cards on these blue highlighted sections. And for the uh, uh, Uthuk player, he has to place them on these red highlighted sections. So let me get my deployment cards for each of the armies I've chosen, and I'll place them out on the board um, in the highlighted sections. Again, you place the deployment cards where you want to in those highlighted sections, so... Um, if you're gonna, if you were gonna have some decoys, um, you know your opponent may not know, and when you're placing your deployment cards out, uh, that's a decoy there, and they're also not gonna know, you know, um, which one's a yeoman archer, which ones is what they are when you're putting them out, because they'll be placed face down, and uh, so your opponent doesn't know what you've placed there, and you'll see that here when I get my deployment cards set out. So I just wanted to show an example here. I'm building this army, so I need four Citadel Guards. So I take four Citadel Guard deployment cards. I need three Yeoman Archers, so I take three Yeoman Archer deployment cards. I need two Rune Golems, so I take two Rune Golem deployment cards. One Rock Warrior, so one Rock Warrior deployment card. And then I'll get two Lore, but I don't get those yet. Um, and then I'll need uh, decoys to make up the rest of the 18. So that's going to be 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I need 6 decoy cards. So I'll take 6 decoy cards and uh, take all these deployment cards and now I'll put them out. How I'll arrange them however I want uh, where these blue spaces are. Alright, so now you can see the Decon player has placed his deployment cards out on the board um, in the same areas as the shaded blue on his scenario card and the Uthuk player has placed his deployment cards again so your opponent doesn't know what units you've selected and what units are where some of them are decoys um, but nobody neither side knows what the other player has put out at this point so once all those deployment cards are put out for both players both sides then reveal by, by flipping their deployment cards over so I'll go ahead and do that um, and come back alright so I've revealed all the cards so then that's when your opponent would see what units you actually uh, chose 
and uh, where you where you deployed them at and then you go ahead and remove all your decoys now I did want to mention I was saying I only needed six decoys for the uh, um, Decon army but I was counting these when I was adding up the total number of units I had there I was counting these two lower which obviously those aren't units that are going to be placed on the board so I needed eight decoys and as you can see I've got them out all right so now each player would go ahead and remove the decoys they put out on the board and then the uh, decon player would say he gets uh, to get two lore because he only deployed 48 points worth of units so he gets his two lore and puts it in his play area so now everybody's removed their decoys uh, now you're just left with your actual units on the board so at this point you'll actually replace your uh, deployment card with um, units so uh, let's look at one of these deployment cards we mentioned this shows the cost um, this information will be on your unit reference cards which we'll see in a minute but what you you do want to pay attention to when you're replacing these deployment cards with your actual units is the health so if a unit has three health then you replace it with three figures of that type um, and that will form one unit so for these citadel guards they got a three health so I will take three citadel guard uh, figures and place them in that hex and that actually forms one uh, unit and now I'll do that for all the others you'll see the yeoman archers will have three um, the rune golems will have three the only one that's going to be different here that I'll show you is the rock warrior if a unit has uh, this blood symbol up here that's actually a damage token icon which means this unit um, is only a single unit but it can take up to four damage so we haven't talked about how you take damage but I just want and we'll get to that later but I just wanted to point out if it has that icon then it's only a single unit so for the rock warrior we would replace it with the uh, rock warrior um, just one rock warrior unit so now I'm going to go ahead and replace all the deployment cards with the actual units and then I'll come back. Alright, so now I got all the units, the deployment cards uh, replaced with the actual units on the board. We're almost done with setup. Then each player draws a hand of six command cards. So, so that would be for this player. Of course, you keep them in your hand uh, so your opponent doesn't see them, but I'll be laying them out, uh, you know, since I'm playing solo. Each player will also then draw three lore cards. All right, so I've got the six command cards and three lore cards for the Uthuk, and six command cards and three lore cards for the... To con. Then each player will choose two of the six command cards and one of their lore cards to place back on the bottom of the deck they came from. So you'll end up with a hand of four uh, command cards and two lore cards to start. So just uh, we'll just say this player is going to return. Uh, since he got two Clash of Steel, we'll say he's going to return one. Clash of Steel and uh, psh, 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 and Patrol Left. So he's going to return those. They go to the bottom of the uh, command deck. Normally, when you discard a card or play a card from your hand, it'll go to the discard pile. But um, when you're discarding these from the initial game setup, they go to the bottom of the deck they came from. So again, here. Um, he would choose one of his lore cards and return it to the bottom of the deck. And so I'll just say he's going to return this one to the bottom. So I'll do that uh, same thing for the Uthic player. 
All right, so the Uthuk player's down to his four command cards and his two lore cards. Again, remember playing against an opponent, you'll keep these um, in your hand, hidden from your opponent. Um, but I'll just keep them face up since I'm playing by myself anyway. And that's it. And then we're done with setup and we're ready to begin play. So let's get to that. How do you play? All right, the game will begin with the player that has the first player token. Um, he'll take his turn, then it'll be the next player's turn, or other player, there's only two players. So uh, first player will start, he'll take his turn, then it'll be the other player's turn, and you'll just go back and forth until one player has won the game. So let's talk about uh, what you can do on a turn. All right. There are two phases to a turn, the main phase and the upkeep phase. So in the main phase, the first thing is the command step. So in the command step, you'll choose one of your command cards. And just because I wanted to show a more uh, simple example uh, to begin with, I exchanged one of my command cards for another one. Of course, you can't do that when you're really playing, but I wanted a more simple example. So. Uh, in the command phase you choose one of your command cards and then you'll uh, read that text from that command card out loud and execute it or you can choose any command card to just order one of your units um, one of your friendly units on the board but the command phase you're choosing a uh, or command step you choose a command card so for example if a player chose this card it says you can order two units in the left section and one unit in the center section. So you can see the board is broken up into three sections. For this player, this is the left section, the center section in between these red lines, and the right section over here. Any unit that's on a section or a space that has a line that splits between they're considered in either section so for instance this citadel guard unit is considered to be in the center section or the right section um, if you play a card that lets you move unit on the center section or right section you could order this unit so for instance this card echelon left order two units in the left section and one unit in the center section he could choose to order two of these units over here in the left section and one of any of these units in the center section. Alright, so after you've um, chosen your command card in the command step, then you go to the order step and you'll then point to the units you're going to order that you can according to that card. So. You know, for instance, here you can order two units in the left section. So you could say, I'm going to order this unit and this unit. And then I can order one unit in the center section. So then you might say, I'm going to order this unit. Now, in the rules, it says you point to those uh, units. For me, I don't know, maybe since I'm old or something, I can't always remember which ones I said I ordered. So I like to use some tokens to mark the ones that I ordered. Uh, again, I don't even remember what old game these tokens came from. They don't come from this game. But anyway, I like to mark which units I'm saying I'm ordering. So I know, but that's not part of the game. You're just supposed to point to which ones you're going to order. And then uh, that card goes into the discard pile. And so now you've done your order step, and now you go to the move step. So... All the units that you've ordered, you may move them if you want to. Now, when a mo unit moves, you look at its order, its unit reference card. Now, I don't think I showed this during setup, but all the unit types that you deployed, you get the uh, unit reference card for those units and place them out in your play area. And you can see their special abilities. And uh, anyway, down here, so for instance, this is Citadel Guard. So I would look at my card for the Citadel Guard. This is uh, their movement. So they can move up to two spaces. So if I wanted to move this guy, um, I could move him up to two spaces. Now, remember, normally um, 
a unit cannot move into a water space. It can move into a water space with a Ford, but it must immediately stop. So if I moved him there, um, I wouldn't get to move my full two spaces because when you move into a space where there's a Ford, you immediately stop. Now remember, for this scenario, the Decon player, his friendly units may move into and occupy water hexes. When a friendly unit moves into a water hex that does not contain a bridge token, you must spend one lore or end its movement. So I could, because of their special powers this scenario, I could move them in there for one, and then they would have to stop unless I wanted to spend one of the two lore tokens that I have, and then I can go ahead and move in their extra space. Um, so that's move. You, you would then move, you may move uh, each of your ordered units. So the, the rune uh, golems here, they can move two also. So, you know, they maybe they could move to right here, one, two. And I just put my little token over there with them so I know. So again, each ordered unit would move if you want them to. Um, then after, e after you've moved all your ordered units, then you go to the attack step. And so for an example of, a, of an attack step, we'll just show, we'll just say that these Citadel Guard were here. They are melee units, and you can see that on the... Uh, uh, on their reference card, they're an infantry, knight, melee. So they can only attack, uh, melee can only attack um, enemies that are adjacent to them. Now something like uh, the uh, yeoman archers here, they are ranged. You can see that here. They're, they're also an infantry, but they're an archer and they have a ranged combat. And if you look at the combat, this is uh, the combat... Um, area here and it shows the number of dice that you roll when you attack but it also for a ranged unit show, shows their range which is one to four so from one to four spaces away but we'll just go back to our example with the citadel guard here so we'll say um, you've ordered them they moved uh, they ended up here um, now it's their attack step so they want to attack these um, flesh ripper brutes so, as I was showing a minute ago, you would look uh, here, and that is their combat value, so they get to roll three dice when they attack. Now you can look and see if they have any uh, bonuses here. Um, they have, uh, if they roll this, uh, they get superior tactics, they can cause one retreat. We'll talk about that in a minute, and they also have pursue one instead of using events this unit may move one hex and perform one additional attack so we, we haven't talked about advance yet so let's just go ahead and talk about using the combat value to attack with three dice all right here's my little dice tray um, so you would roll three dice and then look at your results well I should probably give the steps for combat in detail so first thing you do is declare an attack and declare the attack type you're using, melee or ranged. Then you declare your target. So you, you know, you'd say this unit's making a melee attack against this unit. If you were making a ranged attack, you would determine line of sight. And we'll talk about a ranged attack in a minute, but we're just talking about a melee attack here. So since they're adjacent, there's no line of sight to worry about. So then you roll your dice. Um, like I said, if you have any special abilities or anything that lets you do re-rolls, you uh, do that now. Then you commit your dice. So for instance, if you decide, if I had rolled um, this symbol and I wanted to commit that dice to use this superior tactics ability of cause one retreat, I could not also use it for its regular ability of, of doing one damage. So when you commit dice, you decide first um, if you're going to commit dice to any of their special abilities rather than um, what their normal ability is. So let's talk about what their normal abilities are. So this result is a strike that does one damage if you're making a melee attack. Uh, this result is a cleave 
that does one damage if you're making a melee attack unless your unit is a weak unit and it becomes a weak unit when it is down to one unit um, one figure left in the unit and we'll talk about how that happens here in a minute but as long as you have more than one uh, figure left in your unit then the uh, cleave is st still deals one damage all right um, this one is a pierce that is if you're making a ranged attack you have to roll that in order to deal a damage so making a ranged attack uh, normally the strike or cleave will not do any damage you have to roll the pierce symbol to do damage with a ranged attack the morale symbol causes uh, a unit to retreat so for each one you roll the uh, defending unit the one you're attacking has to retreat one space in the direction opposite of from which you're attacking so in this case if the citadel guard is uh, attacking these um, flesh ripper brutes and rolls the morale symbol um, they have to retreat one space directly back that way now if they were attacking from them from over here they would retreat one space back that way so for every morale symbol you roll it causes one retreat all right if you roll this symbol that's the lore symbol for each one of those you get uh, to, to draw one lore token and we'll talk about what those are used for here shortly and finally we have the uh, heroic symbol and that's usually used for special abilities like uh, here <clears throat> on these rune golems you can use the heroic symbol for a stunning blow stun the target stunned units cannot move attack weight anyway so different units <clears throat> let me find another one uh, like the blood harvester they can use that symbol a heroic symbol for frenzy if they commit it to frenzy to cause one damage um, but then they remove one figure from this unit after combat so after you commit your dice to whatever abilities or regular um, attack that they're used for then if the unit if the opponent has any abilities to ignore damage then they would play that now then they would have to suffer damage so in this case if the citadel guard was attacking these flesh, ri flesh rippers and i rolled this um, since they're not weak they would take two um, damage so when you um, have a unit like this and you take take damage for each damage you take you remove one figure from the board if the, if you would remove the last figure so if i'd done three damage I would remove that last figure and that unit's eliminated otherwise it's still there and now that unit um, because it's down to one figure is a weak unit but when that unit attacks even though it's only got one figure it would still attack with its normal combat roll um, like for the flesh rippers they roll three um, dice so he would still have he would still get to roll three dice even though he's down to one figure but the only difference is since he's a melee unit if he had rolled this he would not do any damage now he would get to use that um, heroic symbol for uh, if he committed it to this um, which we already talked about a little bit if the target unit has suffered one or more damage cause one damage um, so anyway that's how you uh, um, uh, do combat basically again if if one of these roles had been a, a morale you know first you would apply the damage then they would whoever is left would have to retreat so he would retreat back one if uh, I had rolled you know two morales and just one damage he would have just lost one unit but then his units would have to retreat back two spaces a retreating unit cannot retreat off the game board um, so for instance if if these guys had been attacking this um, unit and they got them a retreat well they couldn't retreat back because this is not a valid space so that's kind of going off the game board so if a retreating unit 
has to retreat off the game board or into an invalid space, they can't retreat. So instead, they would take one damage for every retreat um, they have to do, but they can't. So if I if I had rolled this against uh, these flesh rippers, one um, cleave and two retreats, they would take one damage, but then they would have to do two retreats. Well, they can't retreat. So for every retreat they can't do that they need to, they lose one unit. So that would uh, uh, effectively eliminate this unit. Now, if this unit was here and this unit was here and uh, the Citadel Guard was attacking these units and this unit got a retreat, well, because they have friendly units directly behind them, they're considered supported, so they um, would not retreat and they would not have to take any damage. Now, if this unit was back here and I got two retreats, you know, say I damaged one and, and they had to do two retreats, they would still retreat one, but then because they are then supported in the direction they have to retreat, they would not have to retreat the other one. But if we had a situation like this, where these units were attacking these and they had to retreat back this way because there's enemy units to them there, they could not retreat that way. So they would again have to take a damage for each space, for each retreat result they could not resolve. Also, uh, forests like you see in these tiles here, when a unit moves into a forest, it must immediately stop. So if it's doing its regular move, even if this unit, you know, they have a movement of three, if they um, started their move here, and even though they have movement of three, when you enter a forest, you have to stop. You can't continue movement anymore. So now you can continue to move on, you know, on another future turn, um, but uh, on, a t on one turn when you're moving, as soon as you enter a forest, you have to stop. And the same thing with a building, which is um, one of these. If you enter a building, you have to stop. So I'm bringing that up here when I'm talking about retreats, because if this unit was attacking these units and they, had to and they got two retreats, well, they, the first one they could move into the forest, but because they have to stop, the second retreat they couldn't do and they would have to take a damage because of that. So after you resolve retreats, um, the next part of combat is gain lore. So if you'd rolled any lore results, you would get to gain that. Um, the next part of combat is after you've attacked a unit, if you are still adjacent to the unit that you attacked and, uh, and they are not eliminated, then they can counter. And what a counter means is they just get to make an attack back on you um, with whatever their combat um, sequence is. But um, once that's done, then you can't counter back. So the counters don't just keep going back and forth. The, uh, they, they get one chance to counter if um, they're adjacent to you but they have to be in the hex they were originally in. Um, finally, uh, the last thing that happens in combat is if um, this unit had attacked this unit and maybe they eliminated one and then they also got a retreat and that unit moved, then um, you have the opportunity to advance where you could move into the space that that unit um, moved from. And the Citadel Guard actually has uh, a special ability here where instead of using advance, they can move, um, use this pursue one, which they can move one hex. That one means they could move up one hex. So if the unit had, had retreated twice, um, they, they could only move one hex. But their special ability is they can move one hex and then perform an additional attack. So if they had attacked these guys, they took the damage, maybe retreated, then they could use their ability to move there and perform another attack. Now normally, um, when if, if you don't have that special ability, if you choose to advance, then you just move into that space 
but you don't get to do another attack. So that's just the special ability of the Citadel Guard. So now let's just talk a little bit, a few minutes, about ranged combat. So we'll take these Yeoman Archers. I got a bow. Um, remember, we looked that they have a range of 1 to 4. So... So these guys are only one, two away. These are guys are one, two, three away, and these guys are one, two, three away. So those would all be in range. Now, these guys would be in range, but line of sight. You have to determine line of sight, and um, you trace from the center of the um, attacker's hex to the center of the. Um, defender's hex or the target's hex and if it crosses through any other unit friendly or um, enemy or if it crosses through blocking terrain <clears throat> which are hills forests and buildings are all blocking terrain so if that line would cross through that that line of sight is blocked so like um, even though these guys are only one, two, three away, if you trace a line from the center of this hex to the center of this hex, and let's see if I can do that, you'll see it crosses through that uh, hill, so line of sight would be blocked. So they could not attack these guys, but they could attack these guys and these guys. And then. Um, these yeoman archers, uh, where are they at? <laughs> the last place I look. They get to roll two dice. So you would roll two, and it uh, works the same. But, uh, again, you know, retreats, lore, everything works the same, except the only thing that's a hit when you're doing a ranged attack is the pierce. And even if... So if they were attacking these guys and they got a, a retreat, these guys would have to retreat one space back. And as I mentioned, friendly units block line of sight. So like these archers cannot target um, these flesh rippers because this, these citadel guards are in between them. So that would block their line of sight. So friendly units and enemy units um, block line of sight. If these yeoman archers were here, they would still have line of sight to these obscene, because if it's traced along an edge of a tile, you can just shift it over, um, you know, toward the edge that it's along. So you could shift your line of sight over this way and then they would have line of sight and because it's shifted that way if this if this uh, unit had to retreat they would retreat back to this hex not to this hex however and just show an example of that in from the rule book you can see that this line of sight would be traced along this edge but it says you can shift it over but here if it would cross two edges so if you would shift it over this way but then it would cross another edge here then that line of sight is blocked so it's a little bit uh, complicated to figure that out but uh, it doesn't occur too often so that's how combat works now we'll go back to the turn sequence so again you have your you have your main phase of your turn where you do your command, where you pick a card, order where you choose which units you're going to order, move where you move the units that you ordered if you're going to move them, and then attack um, if possible you can attack with any of the units that you ordered. So that ends the main phase. So the next part of your turn is the upkeep, upkeep phase, and the first part of that is the victory point step. So. In the victory point step, if any of your units occupy um, a territory or a space that have one of these banners, 
then you earn the amount of victory points shown there. So if you had units um, here on your victory point step, then you would earn one victory point and you take a victory point token and put it in your play area. If you had units here and here, then you would earn two victory points and you'd put two victory point tokens in your play area. Your scenario card usually has another way to earn victory points. So for instance, the Decon scenario card here says they gain a victory point if an enemy infantry unit does not occupy a hex within two hexes of um, either building outlined in red. So if an enemy unit is in, not within two hexes of uh, this building or this building, then the Decon player would earn another victory point. So during the victory point step, you collect any victory points that you would have earned either from being on one of the banner locations or from whatever your specific victory point uh, thing might be in your scenario. Then you have the draw step where you draw another command card back to your uh, hand of cards. So you'll always have four at the start of your next turn. And finally you have the lore step where either you can take two lore tokens or you can take one lore token and draw one lore card or you can draw two lore cards into your hand and then discard any uh, one lore card from your hand. Um, you can always uh, or you can never have more than four lore cards so if you ever would have more than four lore, car lore cards in your hand, um, you have to, this is the lore cards down here, not these. If you would ever have more than four lore cards in your hand, then you would have to discard uh, down to four. So again, during the lore step, you can either take two lore, or you can draw one lore and one lore card, or you can draw two lore cards into your hand and then discard any one lore card from your hand. So let's talk about lore and lore cards. Lore cards you have in your hand and they let you do special abilities, special effect and you have to spend lore in order to play them. So you know right now I have two lore I would not be able to play this card that costs three lore. I could play this card that costs two lore and they usually tell, tell you when you can play them. So this one says you can play after your opponent plays a lore card your opponent discards his lore card without playing its effects. Uh, this one here, play during your attack step, perform one attack with an archer unit or a unit with the flying ability. So you would get to, if during your attack step, if you had three lore, you could play that card and uh, make an attack with an additional archer unit or flying unit. Um, and so the different lore cards they have different abilities and say when they can be played you can only play one lore card during your turn or your opponent's turn so if you played this uh, uh, lore card during your attack step you couldn't have played one uh, you know like maybe you had one that you could play during your command step well then you couldn't play the one during your attack step you can only play one during your turn and when it's your opponent's turn um, you can play one during his turn, like this one that allows you to play um, during, um, when your opponent plays a lore card. So that's pretty much um, what lore cards and again what lore and lore cards are for. Um, so again, after your upkeep step, you, you do your victory points. You draw a new command card. Um, collect. Uh, do your lore step. Um, and then it's your opponent's turn where they start with their command step. And you go back and forth until one player at the beginning of the start player's turn, if one player has 16 um, victory points, then 16 or more victory points, then they win. If, if uh, at the beginning of the first player's turn, both players have 16 points then neither would have won but if one at the beginning of the start players 
turn one has more, even if they both have at least 16, whoever has more. So if one player had 18 and the other player had 16, then the player who had 18 points would win. It's only checked at the beginning of the start player's turn or the first player's turn. Alternatively, if one player wipes out all the other player's units, then they immediately win when that occurs. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I think I covered uh, most everything. I did want to talk a few more things. I did talk about most of the terrain tiles, and I mentioned that hills and forests and buildings block line of sight. I mentioned that uh, if you move into a forest, you have to immediately end your movement that turn. Same if you move into a building, but there's a couple of other uh, benefits for building and forests. If you move into a building and somebody attacks your unit that's in a building, you get to ignore one damage from that attack. Uh, forests, if you're in a forest, you can roll a maximum of two uh, attack dice um, before modifiers. So, for instance, you know, the obscene, they get four attack dice or combat dice. Um, if they were in a forest, they could only roll two. Now, if they had some other modifier that added to that, um, then they would get to add that. But before modifiers, no matter how many your uh, combat value is on your reference card, you can roll a maximum of two again and then plus modifiers. But similarly, if you're in a forest, an opponent attacking you can roll a maximum of two dice before modifiers. Um, let me see what else. Hills. Um, other than blocking line of sight, uh, if archers or ranged units are on a hill. You know, I had mentioned that enemy or friendly units block line of sight, but if you're on a hill, um, enemy or friendly units do not block line of sight, but buildings and trees still would. So if you had a unit, a ranged unit on this hill, um, like this, and you had friendly units here and some enemy units here, you could still attack those enemy units. Um, well, wait, if you're on the hill, um, you could still attack those enemy units because uh, other units do not block line of sight when you're on a hill. But if these units were over here, because line of sight would be traced through this building, that still does block line of sight. So, I think I've covered most of it. Of course, there's lots of individual abilities. I'm not going to go through all of those. Oh, one other thing I didn't cover. When a unit like the Rock Warrior that I mentioned, you know, there's only one unit, but they can take up to four damage. You know, other units, when they take a damage, you remove a unit from them. Well, since there's only one unit um, for, you know, like a, a figure like the Rock Warrior, when they take damage, you put a damage token on them. And then if their damage ever equals their... Uh, health value there then they're killed so if the rock warrior got four damage tokens on him then he would be eliminated all right i think that covers uh most most everything so why don't we go through a few example turns and uh hopefully that'll solidify most of what i said and uh, we'll wrap it up after that all right let's do a few example turns um the uh, Decon player is the first player. So again, first thing is the command phase, where he'll pick a command card that he wants to play. So we'll just say maybe he wants to play Onslaught. Order three infantry units. Remember my infantry units are the Yeoman Archers, their infantry, and the Citadel Guard are infantry. The Rune Golems and Rock Warrior are not. So I can order three infantry units, and then after their move step, each ordered infantry unit may move one hex, so they'll get to move an additional hex. So, again, now I would point to which three infantry units I want to order. So, uh, I'll just say I'm going to order uh, these ones, these ones, 
and uh, these ones. Now again, I'm going to, just so I remember, I'm going to mark them. That makes it easier for me. If you guys have a great memory, you don't need to do that. All right, well, that's my command step of the main phase. Now I go to the um, order step. <laughs> well, the order step is what I... The command step is where you pick your command card. The order step is where you uh, pick the ordered unit. So I've done that. I'm going to go ahead and discard this card over here into the uh, command card discard pile. And now the next is the move step. Now my... Uh, Citadel guards can move two, and my yeoman uh, archers can move two. So, um, I'll go ahead and move. Now remember, normally uh, Citadel guard here could not move into a water step, but because of this scenario, or water space, but because of this scenario, they can. But then they'd have to spend a lore if they wanted to make another move. Or, because this fort is here, I could move there anyway. I could have moved that even if I didn't have that special power. Uh, but I would have to stop there um, and not use my extra movement anyway. So, either way, I don't think it matters. Just so we can use the special power of this scenario, I'll go ahead and move here. And now, I could spend a lore and move another space, but I'm not going to do that. These guys, um, I'm going to move up on to this hill. And these guys, I'm going to move in here. So uh, during the victory point step, I'll be able to get a victory point. So now I could have moved these guys too and moved them, you know, another space. But. Um, I think right now I don't want to do that, so I'm going to leave them there. Now, I do have the power here where after the move step, each ordered unit may move one hex. So I am going to go ahead and move these guys one hex and move them here. Um, let me finish knocking my board. Now, really, um, now I would move to the attack step. Well, these are guys are melee, so they can't attack anybody. These guys um, are ranged, so these units are in their range, but the forest block line of sight, so they can't attack uh, anybody. Now, maybe um, one, two, three, four. Their range is four. They could attack those guys, but I think that forest is... Well, I think if they shift over to here, where it's kind of tricky. I think if, because they're going along this line, if they shift over this way, I think they are uh, probably uh, able to get line of sight on these guys here. So, one, two, three, four. Oh, no, they're out of range anyway. So, um, they can't attack. So, really, I don't have anybody to attack. So, that's going to... Um, be my move and attack steps and I'm just going to pick up the markers I put down that uh, and now we move on to the next phase so we go to the upkeep step first thing is victory point step well because these guys are on here they get one victory point so they get one victory point token into their play area um, they're not on one of these other ones in this one they gain one VP if an enemy infantry unit does not occupy a hex within two hexes of either building. Uh, let's see. So blood harvesters are their infantry. And that's it. And there's not a blood harvester within two hexes of either one of these buildings. So... Um, he actually does get another victory point for that. Alright, now we go to the draw step. I draw another command card into my hand. And finally the lore step. Now I didn't 
<clears throat> I didn't really look at my lore cards. I maybe could have played one of those. But anyway, I'm at my lore step, so I can either draw two lore, one lore and one lore card, or two lore cards and discard one. So I'm going to do, I'm going to get one lore and one lo lore card. All right, and so that will end the Dakon turn. Now we go on to the uh, Uthuk turn. All right, we'll come to the Uthuk player. So we know he wants to maybe get some of his infantry units up near these buildings so that the uh, Dakon player will not score a victory point for that every time. So, um, I don't know. He'll do, he's going to play Battle March um, for his command step. He's choosing Battle March, which lets him order three units that are not weak. Remember, weak units are units that have multiple figures that are down to one figure, but since the game's just starting, he doesn't have any weak units. All right, so he's going to order three units. Now we go to the order step where he chooses which three units he's going to order. Um, because it doesn't specify, you know, right, left, or center, they can be any three units. So he's going to order these blood harvesters, these ones, and uh, maybe these obscene right here. And again, these tokens I'm putting down, remember, those are not with the game. I'm just supposed to point to which ones that I'm going to order. But again, for me, it's easier to mark them so I remember. Okay. So now we go to the move step. Well, we'll see, we see the obscene can only move one space. Um, but it does say during the move step, this unit may move one additional hex as long as it ends adjacent to an enemy unit. Well, that won't happen. But they will go ahead and move um, one, and they're going to move one here so that they'll be on a victory point space. Um, okay, the other ones I um, did command for was blood harvesters, and they can move two spaces. So these guys are going to move one, two, and these guys are going to move one, two. Okay. So that ends my move step. Now we go to the attack step. Well, all those units I ordered are melee units, and they're not adjacent to anybody, so there's nobody for them to attack. So might as well just go ahead and pick up these little markers I marked them with, because there's nothing further they're going to do. All right, now we move to the upkeep phase, victory point phase. Well, he gets one victory point for being on this building. So we'll give him a victory point token into his play area. And then he also gained one victory point if two or few, fewer friendly units occupy clear hexes. Well, a clear hex is a hex that doesn't have any terrain on it. But we definitely have more than two units on hexes, um, clear hexes. So they won't get a victory point for that. So now he just uh, goes to the draw step where he'll draw a card into his hand. And then his lore step. And again, we should have maybe looked at his cards. He could have probably played this. Play after your command step. Remove one figure from a friendly unit. Then another friendly unit recovers one hill. Um, well, we don't have any lore. We could have played that anyway. So he's going to, instead of drawing uh, one lore and one card he's just going to get two lore for his lore step because he doesn't have any so he wouldn't be able to play any cards and that's it for the Uthuk player's turn so now we will go back to the Dakon player's turn hopefully we get into a battle this time so we can show that all right we're back to the Dakon player he's got to do his command step so uh, I think he's going to play this echelon left so he gets to play or order two units in the left section, one unit in the center section. So um, that's his command step. Now he's going to do his order step where he picks which ones he's going to order. So, um, so he gets two in the left section. So he's going to order these ones and these ones. And one in the center section. So he's going to order uh, these rune golems. 
Um, and I won't put my markers down this time just because that's not what we're really. So he ordered these. He's going to go into the move step. Um, this is probably not a good idea for these guys because uh, they'll be surrounded uh, by two units. But I did want to go ahead and, and uh, show uh, battle. So um, those guys are going to move there. That's their move step. Um, these ones, now even though the yeoman archers, because their movement is two, because they're entering a ford, they have to stop. So they only get to move one, but they'll move there. And then these rune golems, uh, their movement is two also. So they're going to move one, two. And then they'll be adjacent to these obscene here. All right, so now we'll go to our attack step. We'll attack with our... Um, Citadel guard that we ordered. Let's look at their thing. They get to roll uh, three dice. So let me get my little dice tray here and we'll roll three dice. And we declare our target. We'll say they're going to attack these guys because I'm hoping I get a retreat. That'll Since they can't retreat, they'll have to do extra damage. Now let's see if they have any ability. Uh, no defensive ability. Uh, so, alright, so we're going to roll. Alright, we got a strike, a cleave, and a lore. So, because this is not a weak unit, that's, actually, that's two hits against this unit. So, we'll have, they have to remove two guys. And then we got a lore, so we get to draw a lore. Now, um, that's pretty much it uh, for those guys. But these guys now get to counter since they are in their same space. They didn't have to move or anything. So they get to counter. They get to roll three dice. And they got... Let's see, they got this special heroic, which is bloodthirst. If the target unit has suffered one or more damage, cause one damage. Well, they haven't. So they pretty much can't use that. They can use this um, to cause a damage. Now, even, because, even though they're going to get a damage um, now... They still couldn't use this um, if the target has one or has suffered one or more damage because that um, that has to be when you're doing the commit dice step. So right now during the commit dice step, the target hasn't suffered any damage, even though they're gonna about to get some damage. So this is really not going to be useful. But they do get one damage, so we'll remove the one citadel guard, and then uh, they get a lore for rolling a lore. All right, so that's their attack step. Now these archers that I commanded, they can attack. Um, they can attack this flesh ripper because this unit's block, blocking line of sight. But they can attack these guys. They're only one, two, three away. That uh, yeoman archers have a range of four. There's nothing blocking, so they get to roll two dice. Oh, and they did get a pierce, so they actually got a hit. So they uh, damage these guys. Now these guys, because these guys are not adjacent to them, they can't counter back. And then uh, I do get a lore token. And uh, finally we ordered these rune golems. They get to roll three dice. Um, and they're attacking these obscene. Now because those obscene are in a building they get to ignore one damage. All right, so we got, we did get this heroic result, which is stunning blow. Stun the target unit. Stunned unit uh, cannot move, attack, counter, retreat. Um, now, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure of the result of this. Um, so I'm going to do it the way I think it should be. But if somebody knows <laughs> better, they can respond in the comments. Because uh, buildings, it says it lets you ignore one damage. 
but he got stunning blow which is not actually a damage it stuns the target so I think that still applies so you put a stun token so I think they're stunned and then they would get a retreat but because they're stunned they can't retreat so that would cause them one damage but because they're in the building I'm gonna say they get to ignore that damage so that's the way I'm gonna play it that's the way I'm gonna interpret it hopefully that's right uh, if somebody knows that that's not cor correct you can uh, let me know in the comments but um, so they're stunned and now um, I really wish I didn't stun them because I would have liked them to retreat out of there. Uh, but uh, anyway, and now I get a lore token. Okay, so that's uh, my rune golems. Now, um, I could play this death from above lore card, which lets me make another attack, um, perform one attack with an archer unit. So I'm going to do that just to show it. I'm going to play pay three lore to play this perform one attack with an archer unit or a unit with a flying ability so I'm going to discard this this will be my lord discard pile over here and I'm going to attack with these guys again on uh, this unit so again they get to roll two dice oh good they got another pierce so these guys take another damage that's working out pretty good <laughs> all right um, that is it, I think, for my all my attacks. All right, so I go to my upkeep phase. I get one victory point for this. And then if an enemy infantry... Well, now an enemy infantry unit does occupy a space within two hexes of one of these buildings. So I won't get an extra victory point for that uh, special. So let me get my my one victory point so that puts me up to three now my draw step I draw a card back into my hand and my lore step I'm gonna draw one lore one lore and one card alright that'll be the end of the Dakon players turn now we go on to the Uthuk players turn alright I think we'll do the Uthuk players turn and then probably wrap it up as you, know, you probably have a good idea of how the game works um, so he's got his command step. He's got to choose a command card. Uh, maybe he wants to do this one line advance. So he gets to order one unit in each section. Uh, left, center, and right. So um, now we go to the uh, order. So he says maybe he's going to order uh, these guys in the left that's his left section because he would be facing this way so left uh, center and he'll do this one in the right so all right so now he's said who he's going to order so now he's going to do his move step uh, these blood harvesters they get to move two so they're going to move uh, one two all right, then I order these obscene, so they're going to move here into this hill where they can start getting some victory points. And then this guy's not going to move because he's going to attack these guys. All right, so that's my move. So now I go to my attack step. Well, these guys don't have anybody that they can attack. There's nobody adjacent to them in their melee. Uh, these guys don't have anybody that they can attack because they're melee also, but my uh, flesh ripper here is going to declare the citadel guard as his target they get three combat dice so roll their three got a strike a heroic result and a pierce so now we commit let's see what his uh, heroic is if the target has if the target unit has suffered one or more damage cause one damage well, it has. Remember, it started with three units. It's down to one, so it has suffered one or more damage. So he's going to commit that heroic result to the bloodthirst. So that'll be one damage. His bloodthirst will result in another damage, and this pierce won't do anything. But that will eliminate two damage. will eliminate this unit. 
So now he could advance in there since he's eliminated and he will. And I guess that's all the attack um, that can be done. So now we move on to the upkeep phase. So he'll get one, two victory points. And his other thing was if uh, two or fewer friendly units were in clear hexes, but there's one, two, three, four, five. So he doesn't get those, but he does get two victory points. So now he's tied three victory points each. Now he goes to the draw step where he draws a new command card. And then his lore step um he'll he'll get two lore which if he gets two puts these three back that'll give him five he gets five lore so i think we showed a little bit of everything of course like i said all these units have individual special abilities um but you could see you would just keep going taking turns until either one player's units were uh completely eliminated or one player ends up with 16 victory points. They each have three at this point, so it would still be several more turns until somebody gets 16. Um, but I think I've given you a good idea how the game plays. So, I don't know. I, I As I said, I haven't played this game against anybody yet, but I do have a friend coming on the weekend of the 20th of this month and this is a game we're going to play so i will have finally played it <laughs> against a real opponent at that time but even just playing it by myself i enjoy it um i'm sure you recognize this system i believe it's called the command and color system if you've played memoir 44 or, or command and colors ancients or something like that i believe it uses this same command uh, left middle middle or right uh, kind of system but uh, anyway I think it's fun I enjoy it and I'll, I'll know for sure if I enjoy it more here in a couple of weeks when I've actually played against somebody but uh, I know I don't think you can get this anymore unless you get it used um, I got this base game I do have some expansions for it that I've never pulled out and played but maybe if if when i play it here uh my buddy says he he likes the game and will end up playing it in the future then maybe i'll finish painting it and bust out some of the expansions but anyway i think this video's gone uh long enough so uh, thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed it